Kiora, and welcome to Walk in the Shadowlands podcast. Let me be your guide as we take a walk into the shadowy realms of the unexplained, of the paranormal, of things that go bump in the night and haunt your dreams. Your hosts. I'm Marianne. Thanks so much for joining us today, tonight, whatever time it is, wherever you're living in this beautiful world of ours. Sit back, relax, and let me be your guide as we walk into the Shadowlands together and see what awaits us there. Hi everyone, thanks for listening. Most of you who follow this podcast know that I have a paranormal investigation team, although my team and I have not done any investigations for a while due to New Zealand being a very small place and lack of accessible places to check out cost and personal things happening in individual team members' lives. I do miss it and being with my team, so I was pretty excited to be able to speak with a fellow investigator, one moreover who fronts a team of all female investigators in the USA called the Soul Sisters. So without further ado, are you willing to walk with me into this part of the Shadowlands and see what awaits us there? Then let's begin. In 2014, Dr. Christy Sumner coupled her passion for travel, history and the paranormal when she formed Soul Sisters Paranormal, an all-female team made up of Sumner, her two sisters and two family friends. The investigators of Soul Sisters Paranormal travelled to some of the most historic and reportedly haunted locations in the USA in an attempt to determine for themselves if spirit activity actually does exist and to highlight the rich history of each location. Individually, each member of the team is an accomplished professional in her respective field and each holds a master's, PhD or JD degree. For those who may not be aware, a JD degree is a law degree. Prior to forming Soul Sister Paranormal, Dr. Sumner, who holds a PhD in public affairs with an emphasis on criminal justice, was a senior director for a registered traveller company focused on biometric clearances for the travelling public. She was a senior consultant for a biometric credentialing company and she was a college professor at Metro State College of Denver and the University of Central Florida. I'm very happy to welcome Kirsty Sumner from the Soul Sisters Paranormal Investigation Team. So we started in 2014 and we, as you said, we're a group of all female investigators. There's five of us. And that includes myself, my twin sister, our younger sister, and then two family friends who we've known for, for years. And uh, we actually started as an essentially a girl's trip. And because we, we wanted, we all live in different parts of the U.S. So we wanted something that we could do to get together four or five times a year. And so the first one that we, um, that we organized was in Moundsville. West Virginia at the Moundsville State Penitentiary. And we have a familiar connection with that because our grandpa was a prison guard there when the uh, prison was in operation. 
So we have some family ties. So we went to the prison and we stayed the night there. And it was a very rudimentary investigation. We had some night vision video cameras, a couple digital cameras and some voice recorders. And we went in with the mindset of, you know, this is going to be a spooky thing for us to do. But the evidence that we captured that night was so compelling to us that we really decided to formalize our group. We became Soul Sisters Paranormal. And we wanted to really delve into the history of these haunted locations and really kind of figure out for ourselves if they are in truly truly in fact haunted and the history behind those hauntings and the locations with the idea being that we could you know provide some some research and some evidence into not only the historical aspect of the location but also the paranormal aspect so again in 2014 we decided to really formalize the group and we go probably about four three to four times a year on what I would call a big investigation so somewhere commercial like Moundsville or uh, Trans Allegheny Lunatic Asylum or Brushy Mountain State penitentiary. And then we supplement those with smaller investigations, such as residential investigations, or just smaller weekend investigations where one or two of us will go. Right. So that's, and and given that you live in the States, the areas to travel is quite a distance and quite a commitment in time, terms of time and money. So you have to be fairly yes, serious ma'am. about what you're doing. It, you're absolutely right. And and for us, it is a passion. Um, you know, first and foremost, it allows us a, a set time to get together as, as family and friends. And it is something that we enjoy because we do get to visit these historical locations. I mean, not many people can say they've stayed the night in a lighthouse or a prison or the, you know, um, a civil war right. fort or a hospital or revolutionary <laughs> war fort. Not many people can say that. So we can. And so that's, you know, the, the history behind the location is is the first and foremost driving factor for us. The secondary becomes the paranormal, again, to try to supplement that history um, that we research before we go to the locations. So it is a time commitment. It is a, a financial commitment. We are self-funded. But for us, you know, it's it's something that you really can't put a price tag on because of the experience that we're getting from right, it. Absolutely. And tell me a little bit about the background of your team members. I understand that you will come with comprehensive educations (laughs) <laughs> yes, ma'am. Uh, I, I hold a PhD. My twin sister has a PhD as well. Um, both of those are in public administration with an emphasis on criminal justice. And then our younger sister has a Juris Doctorate, which is a lawyer. And then Cara, another friend of ours um, on the group, has her Juris Doctorate as well. And she's also a lawyer. And then uh, Kim has a master's degree in, in education and a historical background. So we do approach it as a research-based group. Um, what what our goal is to is to try to bring some professionalism to the paranormal community. Not to say that other teams aren't professional by any means. That's not what I'm saying. But, you know, for us, you know, we want a strict look right. and feel, um, if, if that makes sense, a, a strict style and branding, because we do put time and effort into this. And we want it to show that we take every aspect of it seriously. So, for example, you know, when we go to a location and we do a day tour beforehand, you know, we all have branded polo shirts. And during the investigation, we all have branded t-shirts and that's just for us just one of those ways that we can kind of show that we are um, very serious about what we do and and how we approach our investigations and it shows in your videos and I was actually quite impressed with the amount for our listeners Soul Sisters has a YouTube channel that shows their investigations and it's actually very well produced I was very impressed with it um from a videography point of view, like your intro, your reveal, and the way you do the history of the sites, it's quite comprehensive. And I can see your educational background coming out in the way you approach this. It's very obvious to me. And it's really quite refreshing to see, actually. Well, well, thank you for saying that. And and I do appreciate you pointing that out because for us, that is the driving factor. Um, If we can provide some information on these locations, maybe we can help provide some preservation efforts as well. And and we really started these videos, you know, we had done some investigations prior to my actually beginning the videos, but I had so many family and friends saying, you know, what was it like? What what did you capture while you were in there? What does it look like? What does it feel like? So, you know, I, I really started to put these videos together 
together. And, you know, the first couple, it, it's definitely a grow as you learn yes. type of situation. So the first couple kind of looked like they were made in my basement. <laughs> but, um, you know, it, it, it is one of those where I really kind of want to stress again, that history, because that's the driving factor. And if I could throw out a, a historical nugget or a historical fact that some people might not know, um, that to me is very rewarding as well, along with the paranormal evidence that we capture. So again, thank you for that compliment. I, I really do appreciate that because that's what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to showcase that historical well, piece I, as well. Well, I felt you did very well. I was I was quite impressed with that. And I guess I recognize in you the same sort of thing I do for my podcast. Like I do so much research. You know, if if it, especially if it's a subject that I'm not too familiar with, I'll do anything from ten to thirty hours of research just so I can present mm-hmm. facts that are legitimate facts and not speculation. Because you know, we're not mm-hmm. about speculating; we're about educating, really, aren't we? And of course, yes, entertaining ma'am. because there's that aspect to it as well. <laughs> well, of course, there has to be. You've got to, you've got to hold the audience to some to for some reason, um, and so there's that entertainment value for sure. But um, you know, we we do try to, like I said, try to find those those pieces of nuggets of information that somebody may not know or may have that. Oh, well, I didn't know that, and that that may prompt them to visit the locations and and put money into it to actually preserve right. it. Now, how do you actually approach your investigations once you've done your research? How do you actually approach approach the investigations like for me with my paranormal team we always go in with a very respectful attitude and first and foremost we try to remove any mundane physical causes of what people could be seeing yes ma'am and um then we anything that's left obviously has to be paranormal or at the very (laughs) least unexplained but we always treat Mm -hmm. spirit like we would treat any living person. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, you're absolutely right. And and I love that that mindset because that's exactly yeah. what we try to do. The- we approach our investigations is, you know, we'll, we'll do some comprehensive research before we go to try to figure out, you know, why is this location here? So for example, Brushy Mountain State Penitentiary in, in Tennessee, you know, we, we want to find out why was that prison built? Why was it pr- built there? What is the background behind it? What are some of the paranormal claims that are there and see if we can marry that with the history. So we do a very mm-hmm. copious research of, of the area of the location. And then we we go and take a day tour beforehand. Um, so either the the Friday, most of our investigations will, will occur on a Saturday night just because of travel purposes. So either Friday or Saturday morning, we will take a day tour. And, and you're right. What we do is we try to look for environmental factors that could influence our investigation that night. So we look for street lights. We look for, you know, are there any, any dogs barking in the neighborhood? Are there any houses that have children? You know, what is going to, are there train tracks? Is there anything that can cause some interference that, you know, we could explain away rather than paranormal. And then also during that investigation, we will scout out locations of where we think we're going to leave our stationary equipment that night. And that just saves us setup time when we go back for the investigation. So if we already know, okay, hey, we're putting a camera here, here, and here, and a voice recorder here, here, and here, we can just go to those spots immediately, set them out, deploy them, and then get back to base camp and get ready for our actual investigation. So we do a lot during, um, we take a lot of notes during the day invest or the the, um, the day tour, so we can prepare for that nighttime investigation. And then when we get to the investigation, everybody sort of has their set roles. So for example, you know, I'll take some cameras and go to a location. Jenny will take some and go and set all of that out, make sure everything's running. Um, you know, and and then we come back and we decide how we want to do our EVP sessions or what handheld equipment we're going to take on certain sweeps of the area or the, of the location. So we kind of have a very detailed plan. Now that's not to say it's, it's militant, you know, there is some flexibility in that, but you know, it's, it's for us a very detailed plan that works because we all have our, our goals and our roles in order to save time because in some of these locations you know you only have 8 10 12 hours um, so you want to get in and, and really delve into the investigation rather than spending time you know putting out cameras and voice oh, recorders absolutely. and such absolutely. and especially since you travel so far you know your time is extra yes, precious so you want to make this so I, t- I totally <laughs> get that now when we were talking the other day before we organized this interview you mentioned that on the subject of ruling out environmental factors. You mentioned a particular case. Mm -hmm. I wonder if you'd like to share that again, because I thought that was actually really awesome. 
Well, absolutely. So, you know, again, we we do have those when you go into these cases, especially for residential or, or business cases, those that were called in to investigate, you know, the first thing that you want to do is you want to in, inform the owner that, yes, you believe them. You believe that they believe that something is going on and you either want to find evidence of what's causing that or, you know, find evidence of paranormal. So, but we're not afraid to tell homeowners or business owners that, while we believe you, there are environmental factors that are causing these issues and it's not paranormal. So the example that you're speaking of, we had a business owner approach us and it was a new business and he had just gotten what he believed was a, uh, a haunted artifact that he put in the store. And after that, he said um, paranormal activity started. Uh, his night vision cameras were going off at certain times when nobody was there and he couldn't figure out the reason why. So he asked us to come in. So we went in and we stayed there for several hours that night and we weren't getting any indication on any of our handheld equipment that there was anything paranormal. Our K2 meters weren't going off. Our REM pods weren't going off. You know, none of the, the typical signs that we get that, that paranormal ex activity exists, none of that was alerting to us. So we set up our own stationary cameras and voice recorders and left the business to run. And we left all that equipment to run throughout the remainder of the night. And so when we were, when we were doing the review of that footage, what I noticed was every time he told me an alert was happening on his night vision camera, my night vision camera was seeing a car go by it, 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 because it was on a corner. So when the car would turn, the headlights would bounce off of a mirror and essentially reflect into his night vision camera and it would turn the night vision camera from day to night and would it would turn it on. So it, it would sense movement because it's essentially resetting itself for night vision after the car went by. And, but because of the angle of my camera, it wasn't doing that, but I could see what was going on. So I told him, I said, I think what's happening is the, the times that you're telling me your camera goes off, it's coinciding with these headlights. So either remove the mirror or tweak your camera so it's not pointing directly at the mirror. And he did. And, and all indications are that his, you know, the, all of that activity ceased because that's what was going on. Um, so if we can find out that type of environmental um, evidence, then that's obviously what we're going to put forth because, you know, for us, it, it's already hard enough to, um, you know, to try to tell people or convince people that, that, that paranormal right. activity exists, if we can debunk it as environmental, then that's what we're going to do as well. We feel that's our job Absolutely. to do as well. So that's, that was the example yeah, that, that you spoke was, of. I thought that was really clever sleuthing. Uh, I thought that was quite well oh, done. Thank you. So do you get, do you actually, I know you do all these um, public places. Do you do many private investigations, many homes and businesses? Yes, ma'am. I would say probably three or four a year, um, really depending. Um, you know, we, we do have some upticks on some years um, and some we don't really get get called. Um, a lot of, uh, because, you know, the, we, we do have a presence on the internet, um, a lot of people from different locations will call us. Um, like we had a, a woman from Indiana contact us and ask if we could come up. Um, unfortunately, that is a little bit of a distance for us, but we do have a network of other investigators that we communicate with um, pretty frequently. So in that instance, we'll call in somebody else and say, you know, while we can't make it physically, here's somebody that we trust that you can call in. So we do utilize that that network of, of other paranormal investigators in the community. But to answer your question, yes, we do residentials and, and business investigations as well. And like I said before, most of the time, you know, we really start off with Yes, we believe that there's something going on um, and, and we want to come in and investigate that for you. Let's get some background information from you. And we really start with with that mindset. Let's get some background information on you, on the building, on the location, what could be happening that could be causing this. And then we will actually give them a voice recorder and say, take this voice recorder into your home or your business and let it run and give it back to me and we'll see what if we hear anything or, or what we think could be going on. And then after that, we will tailor our investigation depending on anything that we find after that. Um, so we really work with the homeowner and the business owner uh, to try to delve into what is going on. Now, there has been several instances where we do obviously catch paranormal activity. And in that case, you know, we'll, we'll convey to the homeowner or the business owner that, you know, we don't remove spirits. That's not what we profess to do. We'll give you evidence that they, that something is going on in your home that we can't explain. Um, and if you want them 
removed, then we have a, a demonologist or somebody that we can call that or a priest that can help you remove that entity. Um, or, you know, we can give you methods to live with it. Uh, you know, how to, to if, it, if it hasn't harmed you, mm-hmm. if it's not a negative entity or a negative threat, you know, we can give you pointers on, on how to actually live with it if that's what you want to do. So we really discuss options as well uh, during those cases, which, which is a that's lot of fun. Really good. So you give people choices. So it takes away from them that sense of helplessness giving them choices yeah oh, absolutely. that's really that's really great and i really like your attitude what is the most what is the home or business investigation that stands out to you the most that you were able to talk about uh, well, probably the one that I mentioned, um, and that, again, was environmental right. factors, because that was us, you know, to us was really interesting. Um, we actually did one, and, and this is kind of a personal one, um, and, and this sticks out, but, um, and this was to my own uh, a family home. Um, my grandmother, uh, this was a couple of years ago, let me go back just a second. So my granddaddy passed away in 1986. And um, a couple of years ago, I had a dream that he came to me in in my dream, and he was in a very specific specific spot in my grandma's house. And, you know, he came to me, it was, it was a two or three night dream. And I remember it so vividly. And I I was talking to my mom and I said, I had this dream. Granddaddy came to me in this dream and he's not saying anything, but I think he's trying to give me some type of a message. And my mom was like, just ask him what he wants. So the next time he came to me in the dream, the very next night, I, I, in the dream, I said, granddaddy, what do you want? And he said, I'm waiting for your Nana. You're going to be getting a call soon. And within two weeks of that dream, my Nana, my grandmother was in an accident and she fell and broke her hip and she never really recovered from that. So we ended up putting her into hospice. And, uh, so the day she passed, uh, and with permission from my family, I, I said to my sister, I said, Jenny, she's going to go and meet granddaddy at that house. I know it. And I know the spot that they're going to meet up at. So because she was in hospice for, for such an extended period of time, we'd had the electricity turned mm-hmm. off in the house. And so we went to the house. There was no electricity. We went to the spot where the granddaddy appeared to me in the dream. We went to that spot. We had two K2 meters going, a, a gray one and a black one. And we had some voice recorders going. And uh, I said, you know, granddaddy, are you here? If you're here, can you light up this gray meter? And the gray meter lit up. And I said, Nana, if you're here, can you light up the black meter? And the black meter lit up. And so through that series of questions, we were able to, to determine that, that granddaddy and Nana met up and that they were together and that they were going to pass on and ascend to whatever's next together. Um, and to validate that, two weeks later, we went back, same spot, same K2 meters and everything, and not a blip on the radar, not a blip on anything, any of our handheld equipment. And for me, that was probably the most mm-hmm. compelling, um, n- not just for paranormal, but just for my own peace of mind that one, there is something that's next. And two, we're not going to have to mm-hmm. face it alone. And it brought me a lot of peace. Um, and so I would have to say, if you want the example of the best residential, that's that's the example that oh, I'll go that's with. that's actually really, really touching. And that certainly would have helped mm-hmm. your grief process and you, you and your, for you and your sister to come to terms with that. That's actually really beautiful. And I actually recently, last season, because when this episode shows, that would have been last season, I did an episode on the ways our loved ones let us know they're around when they've passed Mm -hmm. and appearing in our dreams is very very common very common and the reason for that is because our consciousness doesn't get in the road Exactly. You know, when you're sleeping, that's when you're, you're the most vulnerable, you're, you're yes. the most open. Uh, one of uh, a colleague of mine in the paranormal community, um, she's actually, when she goes to these locations, her name is Miranda from Ghost Biker Explorations. When she goes to these locations, she'll actually sleep. Um, you know, when she goes into the prison, she'll find a place, a cell or something, and she'll sleep for a couple hours because she can go into that vulnerable state and see if she can get some type of feedback from any of the, the paranormal entities that are there. So, so to, your, to your point, you're absolutely right. Right. You know, going into a sleep state or a dream state is that place where you're the most open and you're the most receptive to getting signs from uh, from relatives or other paranormal entities and, and that, that want to communicate that's, with you. That's actually quite scary that she does that. She's very- um, sometimes it scares me. Sometimes it scares yeah. me on her behalf. But, uh, 
you know, she's very cautious. Um, and uh, she's, she's actually one, like I said, uh, in the paranormal community that we've had the opportunity to do several collaborations with. And, uh, you know, she's, she's, she has a style similar to our own where that she's in it for the historical right. research as well as getting pure paranormal evidence. So um, for us to be able to uh, collaborate with her has been just a, a really big blessing for us because we do get to, you know, uh, interact with others in the community. Um, so to to have her come on some investigation with us and then us go on um, some investigation with her has been a really big blessing. So, but yeah, she'll go into a location and sleep for a couple hours to, to see what, what happens. Well, that, is, uh, that brings me to another point. Do you guys do, use any form of protection when you go into these places or do you just go in cold? No, we do have a prayer protection that we say both before and and after when we leave the investigation. Um, And then when we're in these locations, you know, we'll we'll make it pretty clear that unless we give permission, n- nothing in that building or that location is to touch us or, or manipulate us in any right. way. Um, now, for example, if I walk into a room and I say, if you're here, you know, can you touch my pant leg or um, my younger sister has long hair? You know, if you if you play with Michelle's hair or something like that, that's different. But, you know, there there have been some instances where we'll go in and say, you're not allowed to touch us. You are not allowed to go home with us. And we really do set those boundaries. Boundaries. Mm-hmm. And I think for us, it works because we're not going in to look right. for negative. Um, you know, there are instances where we'll go into a location and we'll feel it and we'll back out of that room um, or, you know, we'll approach it in some different way. But for us, our investigations are very um, pure, if you will. We go in with what we think is the right intentions. And that is to tell the story of the entities that we're trying to communicate with. We're not threatening them. We're not, um, you know, going to try to provoke them or go in with a lot of bravado and try to, to chest thump and say, you know, if you're here, hit me. Or, you know, if you're here, throw a chair. That's really not what we're going to do. Um, you know, we, if you'll listen and watch any of our episodes, you'll hear that we always say, we want to yes. tell your story. And that is for us legitimately true. We want to tell the story of what happened and what uh, essentially their side of the story is. And I'll give you an example of, of what I mean by that. Um, there's a location in Central Florida. Uh, it's called the Ma Barker House. And this is the site of the 1935 shootout between Ma Barker and her son, Fred. They were held up in a house and they um, engaged the FBI in a gunfight in 1935. Um, so they were in this house. It was their hideout. The FBI surrounded the house on January 15th, 1935, and a four-hour gun battle ensued. And Ma and Fred, who were both members of the Barker Carpus gang, they were killed by the FBI. So um, the the house has been maintained in the in the family, um, not the Barker family, because they had rented the house. But the people that they rented it from, um, that family maintained the house as it was in 1935. So if you go into the house now, you'll still see bullet holes. Um, the furniture has bullet holes. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, there's there's blankets that you know you can see where the bullets have passed through. So um, that house is what I would call um, mm-hmm. pristine in, in the fact that it still has all of the essence that it had from 1935. So we were permitted to go in as the first paranormal investigation team to actually investigate this location. And we did this two years ago. Um, So we were actually the first paranormal team given permission to do that. And we went in on the night of the anniversary of the shootout. So, you know, we felt that that was probably any time going to give us the best energy if we could get it. And we had a spirit box. And for those in your audience that that don't know what that is, it's it's basically an AM FM radio that's been modified to sweep very quickly through frequencies. So when you turn it on and you start start sweeping, basically you'll hear a as it, as it goes from one frequency to the next. And the idea is that spirits can, can speak through that frequency. So theoretically, you should not have a full phrase being said because it's going through frequencies so fast. So when you do have a phrase being said, it, it is an indication to us that that's paranormal. So we were actually sitting there doing, an, it was just my sister and I, and we were doing an EVP session in the room where Ma and Fred were killed. And my question was what happened in this room and the spirit box through the spirit box it said someone murdered us and i said fred are you here and we got the name fred and then another voice that said that was kate and kate was ma barker's given name 
So to us, to me, that is saying they murdered us in this room, they being Mm -hmm. the FBI. Um, So for me, that is their story. That is what Ma and Fred would want to convey if they had the opportunity to tell their story. And that's what I conveyed in my video that, you know, this is what they believe that they were killed. They were murdered by the FBI. And so for us, when I say, you know, we're trying to tell your story, that's what I'm talking about. You know, those, those type of examples are what I'm talking about. And that's what we, we go in with the mindset to the investigation. We go in with the mindset of we're legitimately trying to tell your story. Right. And I remember the story of Ma Barker that was made into a song, wasn't it? Well, I remember the song anyway. It came out, I think, in the 70s, maybe. Probably, <laughs> yes, ma'am. <laughs> there's been songs, there's been movies about it. And, uh, you know, don't get me wrong. I mean, they they were yeah, a bad group of people. Um, the, the Barker Carpus gang, you know, they... They, they were murderers, they robbed, they kidnapped. So they were probably the worst of the worst of the 1920, 1930 era gangsters. Um, so did they get what they deserved? Probably. But, you know, for me, their story was that they were murdered by the FBI. And, uh, you know, again, that that to us was a very, very compelling piece of evidence when we did that investigation. That was very, very interesting. And you have caught some very interesting EVP. And I recall listening to one when I was watching one of your videos. And I should have written the name of the episode down, but I can't remember which it was. I think it was a uh, hotel that had been turned into a rest home and you got this long EVP saying they just want to talk to us? Yes. So that was um, in Prospect Place Mansion uh, and that's in Trenway, Ohio. And it was actually a stop on the Underground Railroad, um, you know, during during the Civil War. So they had housed a lot of slaves in that house that were trying to move from the right. south to the north. And um, it was it was a very interesting EVP that we captured. We were there were five of us that night on the investigation. And this was in an upstairs bedroom. And we had uh, again, we left a stationary night vision video camera and an audio recorder in that room and two of us were downstairs in the in the floor just underneath that but then three of us were in the basement so two floors down so there was nobody in the area of the voice recorder when this was captured and during the night during that investigation you know one of the common questions that we asked is you know we want to talk to you can you talk to us you know tell, tell us your story um you know give us a sign or something like that so when i was listening to the audio going through our audio review we captured the evp that says they here to talk to us And again, that was very compelling because it's, again, it's a full phrase. Um, It's intelligent, which makes it seem like they acknowledge and and understand that we're there to talk to them. And uh, that was a very cool EVP that we captured. Uh, I would consider it probably one of our best um, EVPs in the sense that it is a phrase and it is intelligent. Probably the next two on my list would be from the Exchange Hotel, and that's in Gordonsville, Virginia. And that was a a hotel that was transformed into a Civil War hospital during the Civil Mm -hmm. War. And it it cared for, the doctors there cared for both Union and Confederate soldiers. But they have over 700 verified deaths that happened Uh in that hospital because it was such an extensive um, area Mm -hmm. of fighting. So, you know, you know, you can go back through the research and and find out the deaths of that hotel. But anyway, so after it was a a hospital, it was converted back into a hotel. So the rooms are very spacious, very big, and and they have the the hotel now as it's set up, they have it to look like the hotel. So half of it, the rooms are set up to look like a hotel. The other half, you have it set up to look like a Civil War hospital, you know, with the gurneys and the beds and all of that. So we had a voice recorder in one of the rooms that was set up to look like a hotel. And the voice recorder was sitting on the bed. And um, during the night, we captured two very good EVPs. One was a child. And the child said, hi, this is my bed which again is interesting to us because it shows intelligence. I think he was talking to the voice recorder saying, hi, this is my bed. Um, And, you know, again, it's compelling because I can very quickly rule out that there was no children anywhere in the vicinity of that house. There's no way that we should have captured a child's voice. Um, A couple hours later on the same voice recorder, there's a man's voice that comes on and says, I don't know. I'll be back at 430. And through the cadence, you can tell it's an elderly gentleman. And there are, again, no men. So again, very compelling evidence to us because we don't have any men in the group. So um, it, it was just a very cool night for us in, in, return, in, in regards to that evidence. Uh, and I would consider, again, those two probably some of our best EVPs. Wow, that's pretty awesome. So you've caught some really excellent EVPs. So what 
-hmm. other evidence has your team caught or what other investigations stand out to you? What is your favorite Mm -hmm. investigation that you've ever done? I'd, I'd say in terms of evidence, the best investigation that I that I think we've done was at the old Gilcrest County Jail, and that's in Trenton, Florida, which is about 45 minutes west of Gainesville, Florida. And it's a it's a jail that is so nondescript. It's in the middle of what I would call not the greatest neighborhood. Um, in fact, when we went there, the owner told us, you know, if, if you have a license to carry a handgun, I would carry a handgun with you um, and keep it with you at all times when you go into the location. And so uh, this was actually an investigation that that I was fortunate enough to do with Miranda Young from Ghost Biker Explorations. And she and I were the only two people in the property, on the property that night. So two female investigators, um, we both carry. So we both had our sidearms with us. And uh, we went into that investigation. In it, So it, just to backtrack a little bit, the jail was uh, built in 1928 and it was in operation until 1968. And it's a very small jail. It's two stories. Um, it, it only has eight cells because the county's kind of small. It only had eight cells, but some of these cells would hold up to eight to 10 people. So um, when the jailer would go home at night, basically he would just turn the lights off, lock the door and go. And whatever, who's ever alive when he comes back the next day, you know, there you go. Um, so there were there were several confirmed deaths that happened in the jail, and after the jail closed in 1968, it sat vacant for for about a decade. And during that time, there were known drug um, deals that went down in that jail, and there was a, a guy that was killed in a drug deal gone bad in uh, 2009, and they called him Mr. Black. So when we went into this location to do the investigation. Um, we set up pretty much every piece of equipment that we had. So from stationary night vision video cameras to voice recorders, um, we had laser grids. We have what's called a REM pod. And for those in the audience that don't know, it's basically a device that measures electromagnetic energy around it. So um, if you were to set it next to, say, a microwave that was on, it would alert that there was electromagnetic energy. So, But in this location, there's absolutely no power. So if we were to set this in the middle of the room and it it goes off, something is causing that. And when we know that we don't have any equipment with us that sets it off, we have to start looking at the paranormal at that point. So we set up REM pods, we set up K2 meters. Um, you know, we had several other pieces of handheld equipment that we used that night. And I would say that this investigation is, is stands out in my mind because it was such a great example of an investigation where every piece of equipment that we had was validating every other piece of equipment. And by that, I mean... Um, you know, we had our EVPs that we captured were validating the words that we were getting on what we call the spirit box. And the spirit box was validating things that we were getting on what we call an ovalus. And that's a, a device that essentially you set in the room and it's been trans, um, it's been modified to say words. Um, so the words that were coming up on the ovalus was validating the responses that we were getting on the REM pod when we were asking questions. So it was a very pure investigation in the fact that we were getting so much evidence. Um, so we, like I said, we were getting hits on the REM pod. We were getting hits on our K2 meters. Um, we have an SLS camera. And what that is, it's a, uh, it's a camera that it, it is set up, to, it set up to an iPad. And basically when you sweep it around a room, it will display anything that it thinks as human as a stick figure on the screen. So Marianne, if I were to point it at you, you would show up as a stick figure on right. the camera uh, or on the on the display. Um, so when we pan it around a room and we know that nobody's there, when it displays a stick figure, we can start to think maybe that this is paranormal. So we had the SLS camera that was, was giving us the, those hits. We had um, shadows that we were visibly seeing walking through our laser grids. And so to me, that was probably the one that stands out the most in terms of evidence. Um, For the one that probably has the best history, I would say our investigation at the Ma Barker house, um, as well as Fort Mifflin, uh, which is a Revolutionary War fort in Pennsylvania. Those were some some great uh, investigations for us. That's awesome. So you've got your audio evidence, you've got your electronic equipment verifying what you've seen. Now, in terms of photographic evidence, have you ever able to um, get photographic evidence of anything? 
Yes, ma'am. And we have this on our website. Um, it's very hard to kind of obviously translate into a video, but we had the fi- the picture on the website. And my sisters and I were actually traveling to San Antonio, Texas for a family reunion. And we stayed at the Manger Hotel, which is directly across the street from the Alamo. And it is, ha- has a lot of reports of paranormal activity. So we're staying there. And uh, during the night, this is about 2.30, we decided we're going to do an impromptu investigation of the Manger Hotel, of the lobbies and everything. So <clears throat> we walked down into uh, into the lobby and we went up to the second floor and there's um, it, it's a, basically a rotunda. And if you, if you look across, um, it's, it's open, but you look across and there was a mirror hanging um, on the hallway. So we were just snapping pictures, you know, left and right, snapping, snapping, snapping. And we probably took, in the course of snapping, probably took about 30 pictures of this mirror or the vicinity of the mirror where the mirror was in the picture. And we're going through those pictures. And in one of them, there's a woman, a figure in the mirror, and you can see her. It's very distinct to us when we looked at it. Um, It's a profile. You see a blue hair bow, you see ruffled, uh, a ruffled collar and a blue dress. And she's kind of got this smirk on her face. And uh, when we showed it to the hotel manager the next morning, he said it was the best picture of paranormal evidence that they have captured in the hotel. And he actually asked us to send it to him, which we did. And that mirror was hanging outside of the room where a woman committed suicide. And I I believe the 1920s. 20s. She committed suicide in the bathtub. Um, and uh, so to us, that was a very, very compelling piece of evidence. Um, and it, it is on our website if your viewers would, would like to take and, a view of that. And speaking of website, what's your website address so our viewers can, can go and have a look for themselves? It's www.soulsistersparanormal.com. We're also on YouTube under Soul Sisters Paranormal, as well as Facebook under Soul Sisters Paranormal. Do you have an Instagram feed and a Twitter feed as well? Uh, not Twitter. I do have an Instagram feed. I really, I'm trying to figure all of that out. Instagram and, and I are, are, we're not the best of friends right now. So <laughs> I'm trying to figure out Instagram. Uh, it's on there under Soul Sisters Paranormal. Um, you, you should be able to find us if you're looking for it on Instagram, but I'm not as prolific on that as I am on yeah, Facebook. Yeah, it's a bit of a learning curve, isn't it? I still struggle with my Instagram for the, for the podcast. It's a bit of a Yes. Okay. So in terms of the instrumentations that you use, one of them, and I don't know the technical name for it, creates this light grid that you, I'm sorry, uh, a light what? grid, you know, with all the dots. Laser yes, ma'am, the laser grid. Yes, ma'am. It's a simple term. Um, so <laughs> in a couple of, in one of your videos in particular on YouTube, it you caught a very, very compelling piece of evidence. Could you tell us about that one, please? Yes, ma'am. We were at Fort Mifflin. Um, again, that's in, in Philadelphia or uh, Pennsylvania. And uh, that area is just so immersed in history. So Fort Mifflin was a fort during the Revolutionary War. Um, George Washington asked a small contingent of soldiers to hold to the extremities so he could get his soldiers out of the area, his entire army out of the area. So this small contingent of soldiers essentially held off an entire British bombardment for, I think, up to four days. And so George Washington could get his army across uh, and out of the area. So that it, it, there's so much history. Again, you can see the bullet holes and all of that. But what is really unique about that fort is they have what's called casemates. And that's where they stored all the, of the ammunition. And they're underground. So when you go into the fort, there's just really big mounds of dirt. And they, they have the doorway and you go in and then you go into these mounds. So what that does is it keeps it cool. And it also really prevents a lot of noise pollution from getting in. So when we go through the evidence and we hear some of the EVPs that we captured there, Again, you can quickly rule out some environmental factors because it's so hard for noise to just penetrate under the ground. So they have a casemate there. It's called Casemate 11. And this casemate was actually found several years ago. They didn't know it existed. It was found several years ago when a lawn maintenance guy was riding his lawnmower over and it sunk. And they found, they dug in, They when they were digging the lawnmower out, they're like, okay, what is this? And they found it's a whole nother casemate. And they have discovered through records and research that that casemate was used as a solitary confinement cell during the Revolutionary War and the Civil 
Civil War. So there was a um, there's an actual documented case of a gentleman. His name was William Howe, and he was considered a traitor. So they put him in here uh, in this casemate. They held him in solitary confinement uh, about seven again about seven feet under the ground, and they executed him at the fort. So when we went in there, there's only one doorway in and you kind of have to to kind of sink down to go into it. And then you go into another little subterranean room and that's where they held him. So when we went in there, um, through, again, through our research, we, we figured out that he was there. And so we wanted to do, uh, we wanted to take some trigger items and trigger items are those items that we feel that we can put in an area and maybe get a response because of that. So we, again, decided this guy was in a solitary confinement cell. So we took a piece of bread, we took some water and we took a cigarette, just thinking that those items could entice him to maybe to speak to us during the night. So myself and my invest my other investigator Cara, we went down into that to that room during the night, and I said, you know, if you're here, can you give us a sign that you're here? Did you see the water that we left you? And both of us heard a male voice saying, "Yes, thank you." And so we that cat we captured that on our voice recorders, and that to me was very compelling. Um, so in that when we left, we left a stationary night vision video camera as well as a laser grid. Um, in in that room, and the idea being that if something crosses the the in front of the laser grid, the beams will be cut and we'll be able to see it as a shadow. It was it was stationed right in the door, and so you could tell it was a little. The laser grid was just a little bit in front of the camera. So if something cut the beams, obviously you would have to cut the camera. You would have to go in front of the camera as well, i.e., step over it. None of that happened. But what we did, ha- what happened during the night was something cut in front of the laser beams. And by my estimation, the, the door in there is probably about five and a half to six feet tall. So this this was about the same height mm-hmm. as that door. So it had to be been about five and a half to six feet tall. And uh, it, it is just a very, very p- compelling piece of evidence because you can see that nothing is walking in front of that grid and nothing is walking in front of that camera. So that is uh, as far as um, visual evidence, that's probably one of the best pieces of visual evidence that we've captured during our it's investigations. It's really, really awesome. And you can actually see that it's a figure shape. It's a shape of a figure. Yes, ma'am. Uh, it looks tall, slender yeah. to me and, and it moves very, very quickly. Uh, very compelling evidence. I would have been absolutely wrapped yes, in ma'am. something like that. <laughs> yeah, and when you capture those, you know, it, it is for us, I mean, obviously – once we're done with the investigation, you know, we collect all of that, that audio and visual footage that we captured, and we have to go through and sit through all of that. So it is a very mm-hmm. tedious uh, process to go through all that. And I'd say it probably takes us about two months from investigation to actual releasing of the video um, because we have to go through all of that. But when you're sitting there and you're watching just nothing happen for five, six, seven hours, and then you get the one shot it's like, yes, this is worth it. This is why we're doing this because now we've captured and we can link that up with the EVP that we captured. You know, we don't only have visual evidence, we have audio evidence to go with that visual evidence. And, and to us, that just makes it so much more oh, compelling. Absolutely. Now, I know that some of my listeners are going to want to know this um, because it's the humans mm-hmm. need to be scared. Um, what is sure. the scariest investigation you guys have done with that's caused you guys to feel really creeped out or really uncomfortable or, or physically scared? <laughs> I, I, I would say probably the prisons that we've investigated, and I would say Moundsville, West Virginia, and uh, the Brushy Mountain State Penitentiary in, in Tennessee, um, as well as the Trans-Allegheny Lunatic Asylum. And it's not so much that you're scared because when we go in, it's, it's, it's kind of like you, you, it, it, the investigation mindset kind of takes in and it's more about the research. But when, when you're standing there in like the Trans-Allegheny Lunatic Asylum and you know that every person on the property is standing here in this one little group talking and you hear a scream from down the hallway, that's extremely startling. Um, when you're in Brushy Mountain State Penitentiary and two of us are standing there um, in a stairwell and you hear 
footsteps running up that stairwell at you and you know that nobody else is there, that's, that's, it's startling. Um, and, and so that, I would say that is probably those areas. And that's to really for us to be expected because of what happened and, and the, the emotions right. that are still even within the walls of prisons and insane asylums, you know, by their very nature, just going in, even if you're not looking for paranormal, just going in and, and just feeling or trying to put yourself in the mindset of what it was like to live there or be housed mm-hmm. there or to be in prison there and try to survive yeah. there. Uh, you know, Brushy Mountain State Penitentiary before it closed was a maximum security prison. And, you know, there were daily wow. killings. And, you know, there was, there was one example of um, there was a gentleman in the cafeteria and while everybody's eating dinner, another, a, a gang, some gang members jumped him and basically just disemboweled him and you know decapitated him there in the cafeteria while people are eating dinner and they they're eating dinner while this is going on and so you know i know it's 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 quite intense um but that's the type of thing that you you think about that you're standing in that room and you're like these atrocities happened in this room um even absent paranormal just what those walls have seen um you know that in prison and and, and like i said insane asylums and even forts to some example um or or even you know the lighthouse and all of that it's just the history that is just really embedded in the walls of these locations it it really that that just kind of speaks for itself but uh yeah to be standing in some place like brushy mountain um, uh, and, and to hear a door slam or, you know, another great example is we were all in the, uh, in the gymnasium of Brushy Mountain. And again, this happened to be a, a collaboration with Ghost Biker. And, um, we had a REM pod set up in the middle of the gy- gymnasium, along with several other pieces of equipment that either had a light on them or glowed. So for example, we had a glow ball and the room is extremely dark. So the REM pod, there's two red lights on top of the REM pod and our, we had a glow ball standing there. There. And we're all we're they're in the middle. All these electronics are in the middle, and we have we are in a semicircle around it. And all of a sudden, a shadow just darts in front of the REM pod, and it blocks out the light. And we all see it. And Miranda from Ghost Biker Explorations was holding an SLS camera, and at the same time, the shadow crosses. She got a hit on the SLS camera. And, and this is in my video for uh, the, if you watch Brushy Mountain State Penitentiary, The Return. And so you see, we, this was all caught, again, caught on camera. So you see the SLS camera have a hit and then you see the shadow run back again. So to capture that on film, all of us in the moment saw the shadow run to the left and then to capture on film the shadow running back to the right to the point where it blocks off the lights of the REM pod is just, it's, it's so compelling. And that's a startling example. I mean, when we were there and we saw that, it's like, I mean, I actually, you know, set an expletive on camera. It, and, and because that that's how startling that was, because you don't, when you go into these locations, yes, you're hoping to see an apparition. Yes, you're hoping to see a shadow or or have something slam in your face or hear footsteps. But a majority of the time, you're in these locations sitting in silence, essentially talking to yourself. Um, so, you know, the, the, the media and television shows have really sensationalized this to the fact where a lot of people that are watching the, these think that it's intense from right. the moment you walk in to the moment you walk out. And that's 30 minutes. So you've got just a 30 minute investigation where everything is intense, your hair is standing on end, you're running out screaming. Um, and then there's a 15 minute evidence review and then a 15 minute evidence reveal. And that whole investigation is wrapped up in a nice package in an hour. And that's not how that happens. I mean, we'll be sitting in a location for, like I said, 10, 12, 15 hours. And there's been times where I'll, I'll leave dejected. It's like, oh, we didn't catch anything. You know, we'll just chalk it up to not our night. Uh, it was a great place to stay, awesome history, but we didn't catch anything. And then we go back to the evidence review and we'll be catching EVPs all night. Um, so that, you know, when you, when you ask if, if what is the most scary or something like that, um, to answer your question in a very long-winded way, I would say the prisons and the, the insane asylums, but, you know, it's it's really those one-off right. situations, you know, where you hear a scream and, and hear a doorknob or a, a door slam or something like that, that really, um, that really startle you. But in the moment, it's, it's really about getting in and actually doing a, a cool research right, investigation. And have you ever had examples of spirit using your sense of humor? Uh, 
I remember doing an investigation with my team one time, and it was a very old mm-hmm. hotel that was sited on land battles, Maori land battles in New Zealand. And I was standing standing in the doorway of a particular room, and all of a sudden this, this spirit appeared right beside me, tall, thin guy, gave me a oh, hell wow. of a fright, and I, I went, because I wasn't expecting that. <laughs> and then on the EVP, uh-huh. we get, as he appears and I notice him, he says, boo. Oh, there was just somebody standing there beside me. They just gave me a start. Oh, you gave me a start. Oh, that, that's cute. And I love those examples like that because, you know, a lot of people, when they think of paranormal investigations, you know, they think of demonic, they think of scary, they think of the dark, they think of, and that's really not how it is. It's, it's a, yeah, if you, if you go into someplace like a a prison or an insane asylum, yes, I think you're, you're going to find those entities that are more, that are gruff, that are, that are darker, that are on the edge of, on the edge of negative, um, it, it, cause they weren't happy right. places in life. But if you go to some of these locations where there are children or something like that, you do have the opportunity to actually have a, a, some fun and to really see that playful side. And so for, for the example that I'll give you, this was at the, back at the exchange hotel. And, um, so before it was a civil war hospital, it was a hotel. And so these, because there was a, a very big train junction there in Gordonsville, Virginia. So the trains would come in from the North and the South. And, you know, when you're waiting for an East West exchange, you sometimes had to stay overnight. So this was a very grand hotel. It had a, a, a large veranda. So families would come and they would stay there. And so there reports of a young child in the, in the hotel named Jeremiah, who really, likes to interact with paranormal investigators so we're on myself and another investigator kim were on the second floor and we were we're on either end of the hallway so she was down the hall from me probably by about i'd say nine or ten feet so we were both sitting on the floor and i had a glow in the dark ball and we each had a k2 meter in front of us so i would say jeremiah if you want me to roll the ball down to kim light up my K2 meter and my K2 meter would light up. So I'd roll the ball down to Kim. And so Kim would say, you know, Jeremiah, if you want me to roll it back to Christy, light up my K2 meter, the K2 meter would light up. So we did this for about 20 minutes, um, just back and forth. And to me that that's a very cool, playful side. And it also validates the reports of a child um, because it's a very childlike behavior. It's a very childlike, Mm. you know, mannerisms of, of rolling a ball back and forth. And it was just a very cool experience. We had a lot of fun with that. And, uh, you know, so, so there are, there are times when it's, it's, there is some jovial interaction. Um, we're at, the. Um, the uh, the St. Augustine Lighthouse and we were just talking of, we were in the uh, the keeper's cottage and one of the reports are that you'll smell cigarette smoke because one of the keepers really liked to smoke he, he, that was his nightly pleasure was smoking a cigar and so we were just kind of standing there talking and we one of us said something to the effect of yeah sure it would be great if we could get the smell of cigar smoke and about four or five seconds later all of us are like well there it is you know there's the smell of cigar smoke so it, it really does show that that intelligence right. level that you know yes they are they are aware um, of us you know you do have those intelligent beings that are aware that 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 you're there that you're actually trying to communicate with them so um, I would say that those couple of examples and there are others but there are, those are the couple of examples of of I'd say of, of a more jovial That's investigation really awesome. and of course you have your intelligent. Um, hauntings, which are the ones we've been talking about, and you also have residual, which are sort of like a tape recorder playing on loop, more or less. Have mm-hmm. you come across many residual? Absolutely. Um, and I'll go back to the Ma Barker house for this example. We, uh, as, I, as I said before, we did the investigation of the Ma Barker house and it was just my sister and I, and we had set up again, some, sta- the, some of that stationary equipment. And then after our investigation, we left that stationary equipment to run through the night. And so, like I said, we had set it up the evening of the morning of the anniversary of the, of, of the shootout. So the shootout happened at about 6 a.m. on the 15th. So we set up our equipment the night of the 14th, January 14th, and it ran until about 9 a.m. 
on to the morning of the 15th. So it encompassed the area or in, it encompassed the time of the yeah. actual shootout wow. of the anniversary. So um, at around when I was listening to the audio, when I was going back through um, at about six o'clock in the morning, which is when the, the shootout would have occurred 83 years prior, um, we get a, we get two EVPs. The first one is what I believe is a female voice saying Freddie. The next one says, yeah, ma. And the first voice again says, get ready. Wow. And so for me, that was a residual yes. communication. It, it, it's that blip in time that, like you said, a, a record that is just really playing on loop. And if you're, if you're fortunate enough to hear it, you'll be able to capture that. And it, it will probably happen at that same time, you know, at, on that anniversary date if you're fortunate enough to catch it. So I would say that that is a very good example of a residual, that it that it's there, it's going to happen. That's how it went down, you know, <clears throat> excuse me, the night of the shootout or the morning of the shootout. So yes, we've captured several um, uh, residual haunting or uh, EVPs like that. Um, for us, a majority of what we capture mm, is intelligent, yeah. I believe, but we do have several examples of, uh, of residual. Have for you sure. ever caught any animal sounds any animal sounds in your recordings we have had a couple of dogs um that we really can't explain um and we had one uh, at the lizzie borden house i haven't released that video yet that's the next one i'm working on um but again that's hard for us um because as much as we try to rule it out um we just can't be 100 percent sure that that's not something that's taking place in the quote unquote right. real world. Um, so yeah, we've, we've had a couple of examples of that, but you know um, it, it's, we've had such compelling evidence of other sounds or, or voices that very rarely, unless it's, it's pretty substantial to right, release that. Course. So you always, and I guess um, you always have other stuff that backs up that as well when you do choose to release. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I understand that. So, Right. And, and so when we, I'm sorry, when we do the evidence review, uh, you know, when we do the evidence review, it's uh, to us, it, it's, it's kind of as meticulous as our, our research and our setup. You know, when we, um, a majority of the time, because of my time schedule, I'm the one that's listening to most of the audio. Uh, my sisters help when they can. Um, but when we find something that we can't explain, the first thing that we do when we have a, what we call an EVP hit, we will actually go back and figure out where everybody was at that location right. at that time. So we all have body cameras that we wear during the investigation. So we all have timestamps of where we were. So we real quick rule out that it's any of us. And then we will cut it. We'll, we'll clip that, that clip and we'll send it to every other member of the group. We won't tell the others what we think it says. We'll say, you know, we'll label it like EVP one or EVP two, EVP two, and we'll send it out and say, what do you think is, is being said here? And we'll, we all try to get a consensus, you know, of, of what we say. Sometimes if, if all of us can't hear it, right. then we throw it out and we say, okay, um, because we, we try to put ourselves in the mindset of the audience uh, and, and say, you know, if, if you can't, if this isn't something that everybody can understand or a majority of our audience can't understand, then, then we're not going to put that forth as, as pure paranormal evidence um, or compelling evidence that we can't explain. Um, so that, that is, it, we have a very rigorous test for what actually gets put out there as EVPs and, and, and um, video evidence and such. So that's kind of how we, we go through that. It's really awesome that you're quite meticulous about, about what you put out. And I think that's really important too, because so many, so much of the stuff that I've seen actually makes me cringe because it's obvious that mm -hmm. people are putting stuff out that could easily be debunked um, simply because they want mm -hmm. to put something out and they want. But there's, the, I guess, natural human bias that you want to perhaps hear something that's actually not there. How do you feel that doing these investigations, do you feel that doing these investigations has altered your paradigms at all? I, I think for some, for, for, for it, it really has. Um, we, like I said, we went into this with the mindset of research and really trying to delve into why these paranormal occurrences are, are being documented. Why are they happening at these locations? And to back that up with, um, the historical research that we do. Uh, and, and it really, to me, it has solidified that 
the fact that there is something after this. Um, you know, I'll say right up front, I'm a Christian. I believe that that there is a heaven. I believe that there's something after this. And it really has solidified right. that for me. Um, I don't think that uh, everybody, every soul passes immediately upon death. I think there are reasons why uh, souls are held back, why that we are able to speak to certain entities and, you know, why we're not seeing ghosts every time we turn around. You know, I, I do believe that like my Nana and my granddaddy, you know, I think that granddaddy stayed. I think he was here and he was waiting for Nana. That was his uh, uh, quote unquote unfinished yeah. business. So I do think that there are instances where entities are staying and, um, before they ascend, or they may never because of certain, you know, like I said, I think there are several yeah. reasons why. Um, so I, I think for me, these investigations have really solidified in my mind that there is an afterlife, that there is something next after this. And we have the ability after this to to mm. be intelligent, uh, you know, to know that there are that there are investigators that are out there trying to get answers that are trying to search. Um, so for me, it, it brings a lot of peace. It really does uh, to know that there is something after this and to really kind of right. confirm that. And I guess there's also for you putting these videos out, there's the, the satisfaction of knowing that in some respects you're helping people, entertaining as well, but you're also helping people to learn that there's actually more. A lot of people don't have these sort of beliefs. They don't have anything that they can hold on to that gives them comfort in these uncertain mm -hmm. times. And, and you're absolutely right. You know, if, if we can can show, listen, there there is something after this. You do continue on. Um, there there is something past this realm. Um, then that's a pretty cool feeling. That if if we can bring some peace to somebody, um, that's that's fantastic. Uh, you know, we don't put these videos out in order to try to mm -hmm. convince anybody of paranormal or to convince anybody that there's an afterlife. What we're attempting to do is put forth a very true investigation based on the history that we've we've uncovered, um, a very true investigation of going in, actually asking questions, and to the extent that we can, trying to find answers. Um, if, if somebody doesn't believe it or somebody wants to, you know, say, hey, I think I can debunk this, then that's great. And we're willing to absolutely have that dialogue. But, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, again, I'm not trying to convince anybody to change their belief structure or try to change their idea of the next realm or paradigm. That's not what we're attempting to do. Um, what I, like I said, what I'm attempting to do is say at this moment in time, there were four females in this location. We captured a male voice and I can't explain that. Um, or, you know, we, we're standing here and this door slams and you catch it on camera. And I, th that's something that I can't explain. It's very compelling um, evidence of something manipulating this. So, uh, you know, for me, not so much trying to change people's minds, um, but if if that helps to reinforce a belief of the paranormal, then sure, I, I, I'm I'm glad that we can do that for you. But it's not trying to say because I've had a lot of um, interviewers ask me, you know, you know, are you trying to convince people? Mm -hmm. And that's that's really not what we're trying to do. Puts again, just put forth some historical facts about some very cool locations and backing that up with evidence mm. that I can't explain. That's essentially well, what I we're doing. I didn't get the impression at all watching your videos that you were, my impression was that you were just presenting what you saw, what you captured and leaving it up to the person watching to decide for themselves. That's the impression that I got. So I, I, I really applaud the way you guys do that. I think that's really good. You don't sensationalize, you don't speculate, you just present. <laughs> well, thank you. And, and I appreciate that. And I'm, I'm glad that it shows. And for us, you know, there, there really isn't a need to sensationalize. You know, I feel that the evidence that we're putting out there really does speak for itself. I, I don't have to sensationalize a male voice saying, I don't know, I'll be back at 4.30. Um, I can tell you that that is what happened and there was no males in the area. You know, I know that the paranormal shows, the, the popular media shows that are out there, they have to sensationalize to some extent to get the audience base. And, and I get right. that, you know, um, I, I do think that the paranormal shows 
shows have done a great service to the paranormal community because it has gotten, you know, it, it has brought it more into right. the mainstream, if you will. But then it also does a disservice to us that are out there trying to legitimately do a paranormal investigation because you do have those people in the quote unquote normal society that see a paranormal investigation as a 30 minute deal where followed by 15 minutes of, of, of evidence review and then 15 minutes of, of a reveal. And, uh, you know, it's just, it's just not like that. So when we have guests that come with us on some of our investigations, they're like, you know, we're just sitting here. What's, what's supposed to happen? I said, well, nothing. That's, you know, that's how most of these investigations are going to go. It's sort of like fishing. <laughs> You've got to wait, you, you know, you, yeah, and you may leave here without having any personal experiences. I mean, there've been some locations where we haven't had any personal experiences when we go into these locations. And like I said before, I, I'll leave saying, you know, it was a great night. It was fun to be in this, this fort or this prison or this gangster house, but mm -hmm. it just wasn't our night. But then you start going back to the evidence and you start reviewing and listening and really sit down and go through this large amount of evidence. And you'll start, you'll start hearing things. You'll start capturing things. Um, you know, I like to say that, that, Everybody hears, but not a lot of people listen. Mm -hmm. And if you go into these locations and you actually put yourself there mm -hmm. and you listen, you will eventually start to hear. And that to me is is really the cool factor of, of doing right. some of this. It's your intent you go in with as well, isn't it? Uh, I, and and oh, I absolutely. have a Facebook group called Walking the Shadowlands, which actually is the reason I started the podcast because the members asked me to. And one thing I consistently say to my members is intent is everything. And your intent mm -hmm. is the energy you put out and it's what you get in return. Well, and you're absolutely right. And, you know, I, I'm not going to disparage those groups that that want to go in with bravado, that want to go in and say, you know, we're going to go stir up the dead. If that's if that's how you want to conduct your investigations, that's fine. And, you know, if you have a great substantial YouTube following base because of it and that's what they want to watch. Fantastic. Um, but, you know, for us, that is that is not mm. what we're trying to do. One hundred percent. We're like you. We, we go in with the intention of legitimately trying to tell a story and if we can expose the location and and have have it um you know more into the mainstream where people see these locations and say hey i may want to visit there or i want to know more about this and it can preserve those locations that's really our main goal and uh you know if 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 people don't like what we do or they think that it's not fast enough or sensational enough for them you know they can find another youtube channel where where somebody is is doing something that's more sensationalized if you will but you know for us it's it's all about finding um you know pure paranormal evidence or evidence that i can't explain and really connecting it with the location right. and the history and i think that's actually really awesome now a couple of questions oh, that i remembered that i was going to ask you earlier one is <laughs> have you guys ever heard disembodied voices as opposed to just evp oh absolutely uh and and that that apps actually happens with some frequency for us. Um, uh, again, I think not that I'm saying that that all female teams are, are better, um, but I think because females in my mind are a little bit more empathic um, just by their nature of, of being female and, and not going in with, with again, that bravado or looking for anything negative. I think when we go in, um, you know, we're, we're actually in the mindset of listening at that point, once you cross that threshold. And yes, we've heard disembodied voices in the moment. Um, you know, one of the examples I'll go back to is the old Gilcrest County Jail. If you watch that episode during our walkthrough, the day uh, the day tour that we did um, Miranda's holding her camera and we're just kind of talking amongst ourselves and she pans the camera and you hear a voice behind her saying hey come back and we heard that in the moment and so we were fortunate enough to capture it on our camera wow. Excuse me. And uh, so, yeah, there's been several instances where, you know, we're standing there and you you hear it behind you or you hear a voice beside you. Um, we were at uh, Brushy Mountain State Penitentiary. And again, this just happened to be the the collaboration with Miranda from Ghost Biker. Um, and we were walking through a, a corridor and every piece of audio equipment that we had going heard this slap on the wall, like somebody had just taken their hand and whacked the wall really hard. And 
um, uh, Miranda's camera guy, Josh, turned around and said, did y'all hear that? And we're like, yeah. And at that moment, a voice said, I warned you. And so that that was pretty cool. Um, one of us heard that in the moment, but it, it was able to be picked up on all of the audio. So it's not mm-hmm. just disembodied voices. I mean, we hear footsteps. I mean, you uh, there's uh, the West Virginia State Penitentiary. We were sitting there and you hear footsteps. I mean, in the moment while you're sitting there, you hear footsteps running down the hallway to you, toward you, to the point where you know something is going to materialize in front of you in the dark. That's how loud these footsteps were. Um, So doors slamming, we hear those in the moment for sure. Um, But uh, yeah, we've had numerous instances of of disembodied voices in the moment. It's quite interesting when that happens. And it's especially good when you capture it on audio as well to back up. So for for listeners Mm -hmm. who don't know the difference, a disembodied voice is a voice that's audibly heard and perhaps captured on on recording as well. An EVP is a voice that's not audibly heard but is captured on a digital device or on the video or something like that. The other question that I had was, have any of your teams ever seen a full apparition or a partial apparition? We have. Um, Again, I'll go back to the Gilcrest County Jail. Uh, Both of us were standing there. And at the same time, we thought we saw a shadow go by. Um, And then we're because we're standing outside of a doorway and we thought we saw saw it running across the hallway. And I said, you know, did you see that? And at that same moment, it ran back to the left. And you can hear us talking about it on camera. And we just so happened to have a video cam or a night vision camera with a laser grid in that, in that same spot. So as you're hearing us talking, you can see the shadow cross the laser grid. Um, So we saw it at the moment that it crossed the laser grid, which was pretty cool. Um, And I'll have to say, I'll go back to brushy mountain. Um, Several of us saw uh, a shadow figure there. Um, uh, Hales bar dam, uh, which again is in Tennessee. We did see an, an apparition there, um, more of a mist. And that was captured on camera as well. Um, uh, we've not really seen a full bodied apparition as, as I guess we would describe it. Um, I think for me, that would be my mm. Holy grail. If we were able to see a full body apparition and actually know who it is. So for example, if I were to see a full body apparition and say, okay, that's Abraham Lincoln. I see that. I know it. Um, I think that's the Holy grail that I'm looking for. Uh, But, uh, and I think obviously a lot of paranormal investigators would, but uh, to answer your question, yes, we've seen shadow figures and we've seen what I would consider apparitions, but not any that I could say with certainty, I know who that is. And that's what makes it so exciting and compelling and makes you want to return Mm -hmm. again and again and again to do this. It sort of becomes an addiction, Mm -hmm. doesn't it, in a way? You know, it it really does because, you know, um, like I said, it it is kind of like fishing and the fact that, you know, you, you can be listening to 10 hours of audio and all you hear is just static for 10 hours. And then all of a sudden you get this voice coming through the, the static. And it's just, that's the reason why you do it. That's the reason why you pick up the next voice recorder and listen for another 10 hours to find that again. Um, so it is, it is very addictive. And, you know, there's been several places where we've been fortunate enough to go back multiple times. And, you know, I really like those investigations because, they build Mm -hmm. off the first investigation. So for example, we were able to go back to Brushy Mountain Penitentiary State Penitentiary a second time. And so we took what we learned and what we heard and what we captured from that first investigation and really um, applied that to our second investigation. You know, it led our our EVP session questions. It led um, the first investigation allowed us to know where to place cameras or where not to place cameras or things to do differently or uh, trigger items to use. We're very big on trigger items. Um, and, and that for us, I think is, is something that is very compelling and, and allows you to get some, some different reactions. Um, so, so like I said, bringing different trigger items based on what we learned in that first investigation. So being able to go back to a location a second time or multiple times is, it, it is, is very cool. If you go to a location more than once, do you, have you ever had an experience where spirit has remembered you? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that was actually, and that's a great question. That was actually, um, I would say our best example was uh, West Virginia State Penitentiary. And the first time we went, like I said, that was our very first investigation, very rudimentary, uh, you know, not, not really a concept of where we wanted to go as a group. So we just had um, very minimal equipment on that one. Um, But what we captured allowed us to really tweak our second investigation. And from the, 
from the first investigation and the research and, and then subsequently the second investigation, uh, we realized that there was a, a spirit in there. Um, he's a very well-known spirit to all paranormal investigators. His name is Red Snyder. And he was this in life, he was a very bad individual. He was a murderer. He was a leader of the Aryan yeah. Brotherhood. Aryan Brotherhood while he was in the in the penitentiary. And um, so, I mean, he would kill without a, a thought. Um, but one of his main vices, if you will, is he loved the soap opera The Days of Our Lives. So during the day, they would wheel a television set in front of his cell and he would watch Days of Our Lives. So what we did on our second investigation is I actually downloaded an episode of Days of Our Lives onto my laptop and we put it in his cell and I let it run for an hour. We left the building entirely. I let it run for an hour. And, uh, and because I wanted to connect with him to say, okay, I know this is what you liked. I'm giving this to you. Hopefully you'll respond to us. And, you know, I, I think he did because when we went back there um, later that evening and did an EVP session, we had a very cool K2 session back and forth. Um, and, it, and what's very compelling about it is um, a, a guest investigator, Christopher, was holding an EVP, uh, a K2 meter and Michelle, my investigator, was holding another one and they were maybe within about a foot and a half of each other and there was nothing that could have set these K2 meters off. But we were asking it to go back and forth between these two meters and based on the questions and it was. And so that to me is very, very compelling because if there's any electricity in the area or, or uh, electromagnetic magnetic waves in the area, both of those two meters mm -hmm. should have been responding at the same time, but they weren't. Um, they it was just doing it based on what we were telling it to do. And so um, after that K2 session, we said, uh, you know, that was very cool. Thank you. And behind us, we got a disembodied voice saying, no, thank you. And I think that was a recognition of, you know, you, you recognize me, you recognized what I liked in life. And I appreciate that. And that's why I was able to communicate wow. with you. That was a very, very cool investigation for us. And, you know, um, like I said, I really like doing those type of trigger items and something that's unique to the location or to a, a specific spirit that we're trying to interact with. Um, if we can do that, I feel that that's necessary because I mean, in, in life, if, if you look at the basic human needs, one of those needs is to be recognized. You know, we don't want to stand in a crowd and not be seen. And I think that's the same way with entities um, in the spirit world. Uh, you know, they, yes, we're talking to them and you can go into a room and say, is anybody here with us? But when you can say, hey, Red, you know, are you here with us? I'm, I'm, I'm acknowledging you specifically. I'm, I'm giving you uh, an episode of Days of Our Lives. I'm giving you a cigarette, which I know you like to smoke. Um, I'm recognizing you as the entity. Right as read the entity, um, you know, and, and that's who I'm trying to communicate with. I think that goes a long way um, for, and I, I do think that's why we've been so fortunate in getting very compelling right. evidence. I, I agree. It's respect, isn't it? It's all about respect. Mm -hmm, and, absolutely. And, and it's, that's what I often say to, to members in my group who are having paranormal things in their homes, you know, and they're saying, oh, well, it's, doing this it's slamming that and I said say to them well have you acknowledged its presence how would you exactly feel if exactly you knew that somebody was aware that you were there and they were trying desperately to talk to you but you just ignored them there's no difference mm -hmm. Exactly. And that's why one of the things back to your questions about residential and paranormal or uh, uh, business investigations, uh, that's why the first thing I do is give them mm -hmm. a voice recorder. Take this voice recorder home set it down. And if something happens, start talking. You may say, it may sound weird, but just start asking questions. Who are you? How long have you been here? Do you know you're dead? Mm -hmm. uh, those type of questions and see if you get any responses. Um, because that, I mean, that's the first thing. Recognition is the first thing. Um, if you really want to be a paranormal investigator and you really want to excel in this field, you have to recognize um, that you're not going in there just to talk to the air. You're going in there to try to figure out a specific right. story. And uh, that, that's how I think you need to approach an investigation. I, agree. I absolutely agree. Oh, look, um, Chrissy, I, I've thoroughly enjoyed our conversation. And um, I'm aware of, of time is moving on. So I, I will close our, our uh, conversation today. And thank you so much for taking the time to share your, your memories, your experiences, your journey with us. One last question before we do close is where do you think that you and your team are heading from here on in what's your next plan of action 
Well, we have several investigations that are still lined up. Um, and so that's in the near future, uh, you know, continuing what we're doing, really kind of grow in the paranormal community. Um, you know, when we first started this, we, it was, it was, we really felt, um, you know, that I wouldn't say alone, but we really didn't realize how vast the paranormal mm -hmm. community was. Um, but when you go out and you really start talking to other groups and you start meeting people and you start collaborating with like-minded paranormal investigators, you know, that to us is is very refreshing and rewarding. So we're actually trying to expand and grow in the paranormal community. So doing, you know, amazing podcasts like yours. And, and again, thank you for inviting us to be here. Um, you know, doing, doing, podcast and stuff like that is is something that we want to do to kind of bring awareness to our group but as well as the paranormal community right. as a whole um you know we're, we're very big with collaborations like i said we've done several with uh, ghost biker explorations and so to reach out and, and to really um get with those like-minded uh, paranormal investigators is something that we're really striving to do um and really grow with that in the in the following years um you know, we never really, I do get asked a lot if this is going to uh, propel us into a TV show or something like that. That's never been a main goal of ours. We've been approached by a couple of producers um, and we've had serious talks with them, but, you know, both of them really wanted us to mm. change our style and our approach. And that's not what we do. So we've respectfully declined those invitations. Um, but, you know, that, that may be something in the future of, of where we want to take this. If we could find the right producer or something like that, you know, that may be something in the future. But for now, it's really really just about us getting together four or five times a year, having a great experience, going to some very cool uh, historic places and, and just really trying to put forth some compelling evidence, again, that, that we can't explain, but maybe further the dialogue of, of the paranormal, of the paranormal community, and maybe attempt to elevate this out of a subculture and into more of the mainstream um, in a very respectful way rather than sensationalism. And I wish you luck in your journey. And I'm going to be watching you guys from the sidelines and see how you go. And maybe sometime in the future, we can have you back when you've got your new investigations up to hear more about what's been happening. I'd, I'd really like that, I think. Absolutely. I would, I would love that opportunity. And again, thank you so much. to thank Christy for joining us today and sharing her experiences and knowledge with us all. As she said in the conversation, Soul Sisters has a YouTube channel where they put up videos of all their investigations, all links to the Soul Sisters website, YouTube channel and Instagram account can be found from this episode's page on the podcast website www.walkingtheshadowlands.com. Our great bumper music today was used with the kind permission of Kirsty and was especially commissioned by the Soul Sisters for the YouTube channel. It is copyrighted to the Soul Sisters and cannot be used without explicit permission. If you have any suggestions for topics you might like me to cover in upcoming episodes, then please don't hesitate to contact me. Or if any of you have any questions, suggestions or any comments that you'd like to make or experiences that you might like to share with myself or my audience. Or if you feel you might be a good fit as a guest on my podcast, then just email me at shadowlands at yahoo.com or check out the Be A Guest page on the podcast website. Check out our Facebook page, Walking the Shadowlands, our Instagram feed of the same name and our Twitter feed, at Shadowlands 10. Like and follow for hints on our upcoming episodes. If you enjoyed this episode, then please leave a positive rating and don't be shy to leave a written review on your chosen podcasting platform or on the podcast Facebook page, Walking the Shadowlands. And of course, so you don't miss out on any episode, make sure you subscribe on your favorite podcasting platform. This podcast is available on all free podcasting platforms and iHeartRadio as well. Also, if you have Alexa, simply say these four words, Open Walking the Shadowlands, 
and Alexa will play our latest episode for you. If you don't have a smartphone, then you can listen to the episodes from the podcast website, www.walkintheshadowlands.com. For those hearing impaired, there's a full written transcript of each episode on the website, so you don't miss out at all. Tell your friends, tell your family, tell your workmates about our show. Encourage them to listen and to subscribe also. The more, the merrier. Thank you so much for listening today, tonight, whatever time it is, wherever you're living in this beautiful world of ours. We'll see you in two weeks' time. Thanks for listening. 